Let's uh, pray together today if you join me. Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, we earnestly come before you with open hearts today to hear with fresh ears the message that you have for us through your word just as the apostle paul spoke it to the churches in that first century to these churches in galatia we come with equal need today with as great a need as they had we live in a day of confusion we live in a day of many other competing messages and competing voices we live in a day where there are so many things competing for our attention and the enemy could so subtly sneak in sometimes our lord and draw us into another way or another gospel and so today lord jesus uh, we're just desperate and earnest we're on our knees we're on our faces before you today asking you to bring truth to us in this time thank you for your spirit that's already been here so evident through the readings and through the songs thank you for being with us across these many miles through the technology now we ask that you would anoint your word that you would establish it we ask today that the word of the lord would run quickly and be glorified we ask that even as in the book of acts the word of the lord as luke recorded would grow mightily and prevail and lord as we um, begin this venture in the book of galatians over these weeks and over the next several months we ask that you would just unfold truth i ask for wisdom for every speaker i ask for wisdom for our a spiritual wisdom and understanding to be granted to us as listeners and truly give us seeking hearts listening ears the the willingness the ability to listen and to bring our lives absolutely under your authority the authority of jesus christ uh, just as the message says in galatians so today lord as we i pray that you give us a glorious beginning to these uh, to this series I pray for every family represented here in every household that you would touch them as they enter into this school year beginning this week that lord they would just experience your presence your grace your strength that lord it would be more than just academics and uh checking off requirements you would shape us this year shape us today shape us lord jesus um for what you have for us and in the times ahead we love you today in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you for joining us again i'm dr juneman it's a privilege to be titled the guidance and leadership pastor for clm just here to help and serve in any way i can these outstanding students who uh, so graciously lead this ministry on a weekly basis and we're very excited to kind of be merging this into a TPS chapel service for this upcoming year. So beginning next week, we hope to have many more students here as students and families are uh, joining in for classes beginning next uh, this next week. Hopefully next Saturday, as Mr. Crosby is going to be sharing, we'll have a great attendance of uh, families representing TPS. Have a wonderful um, times of spiritual formation and chapel this year. So be in prayer for that time next week, will you? And all the speakers, you can see it on the CL page all the upcoming speakers uh, for the various presentations out of Galatians so thank you so much for being here today I regret that my webcam does not seem to be working today and so no problem with that we never depend on technology do we everybody we always have to kind of roll with the punches and uh, take what we have so we'll just have the audio and the images on the whiteboard today so uh, again starting in Galatians <clears throat> This is a new study for me. I don't know uh, about others, but it, the book of Galatians is not something I've had an opportunity to study very much in depth before. So I'm very exciting for me. Um, so um, as most of you know, whenever we're going to study a book of the Bible, we want to do our homework and do a lot of the background on, on that. So some of what I'm going to do today is hopefully set a little background uh, foundation for the coming weeks that we can look at that everything in Galatians through that lens of who wrote it, who did he write it to, when did he write it, what was the occasion for that writing. Now, as we already said, it's quite likely that Galatians is the first of the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. 
Um, he had just returned from his very first missionary journey. And we're going to look at this a little bit, but if you have one of those Bibles that has the maps in the back, how many of you have that? You got a map in the back of your Bible. You, you know, it's one of those things you never look at in your Bible, right? Well, I find a lot of value in those. So if you have a map in the back of your Bible, I'd invite you to just give your attention to that for just a minute. Um, if you can find a map of Paul's first missionary journey, that would be really helpful. I'll show you an image of that in a moment. But what you'll see on that map is that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark started out from what kind of served as their home church. And we talked about this in some of our classes, Bible survey. We touch on this quite extensively. But some of you might know that Antioch there in Syria and if you'll see it up there, it's it's going to be on that northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. You're going to see a little city, uh, and you'll see it's the beginning point and the ending point of this first missionary journey. It's called Antioch. Let me get you that diagram for you real quick here. So you can got to see Antioch there. Antioch kind of served as the home sending church of all Paul's missionary journeys. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Um, some of you may be familiar with missionaries. Some of you may be missionaries. And you all understand the importance of ascending church, right? Everybody with me on that? You got to have ascending church. Ascending church is very important for support. It's very important for prayer. It's important for accountability. And Antioch was, a, Antioch was the first primarily Gentile church. It was the first church that was mostly consisted of Gentiles. And for that reason, it was a little bit controversial with some of the Jewish believers. As you know, many of the Jewish uh, people down in Jerusalem in that area had also converted to Christianity and accepted Jesus as their Lord and as a Messiah. And they weren't so sure about all these Gentiles that were now becoming Christians as well. And Antioch was primarily was an exciting, growing church made up mostly of Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas had gone up there to do some teaching of these Gentiles. And it was there at Antioch, you see um, Acts chapter 13 and then Acts chapter 16 and other places that the Holy Spirit directed for these men to be sent out on these missionary journeys. The Holy Spirit did the sending. And so you can see there that after they went to Cyprus, which was Barnabas's home area, so he was very familiar with it, had a real affinity for Cyprus. They went on to this region of uh, the Roman province of Galatia. Now, you can see the lines are kind of mixed there, but you can kind of see the green territory there, Galatia, that they went to these four cities. Well, actually, probably five if you count Perga. But they went to these four main cities where they started churches, Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Can everybody see that on the map? You kind of get in a visual on that. So these are the places that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas went on that first missionary journey, and they started these churches there. Now, before we go on to that, let's back up for a minute, talk a little bit about this. This was very new territory. Obviously, all these missionary journeys were going to be into new territory where they had not been before. When they go out on the second missionary journey a few years from now, it's going to go even further out into uh, Europe, into Macedonia. And so they're really going to be branching out. But all the, this is new territory. And if you read things like, let me recommend a resource to you. Um, some of you have heard of a series of books called The First Century Diaries by Gene Edwards. Let me just highly recommend that series of books to you. If you really like um, reading kind of historical fiction, you want to get a hold of a series of books by Gene Edwards called The First Century Diaries. It's one of my favorite series. What it does is it, it, it fleshes out what Paul's missionary journeys looked like kind of on a daily basis, moment by moment. What was he experiencing? What was it like? It's kind of putting you on the ground on Paul's missionary journeys. And in the very first volume, he describes this first journey into Galatia. I believe it's called The Silas Diary, is that first book. And it's very graphic how violent of an area, even getting from Perga up to Antioch, there was threat of uh, robbery. 
there was threat of physical harm. So it was very, very, very difficult area that they found themselves in, even life-threatening in more ways than one. We find out later in Acts that when they actually are preaching the gospel in these places like Antioch of Pisidia in Iconium and then in Lystra especially, they're actually beaten and left for dead. So it's very, very life threatening. See, um, everybody, this is more than flannel graph stories, right? This is real stuff that took place. This is more than just some nice Bible story that's nice and clean. This is real stuff. These guys were living on the edge. They didn't know where their next meal is going to come from. Uh, they're not sure where they're going to sleep that night. They're in life-threatening situations because they're preaching the gospel, literally being chased out of towns, being beaten and left for dead. These were the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And yet, in the middle of that, in every one of those cities that you see there on that map, there was a response from Gentiles mostly. And these Gentile believers came together and formed those churches in what we would call then the churches of Galatia. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of with me so far? These are what basically formed as the churches of Galatia, and these would later be the recipients of this letter. Got it? Everybody there. All right, good. All right, so then it's interesting that they not only, you can kind of see on the map, that after Paul preached at Derby, which is probably their best response, you know what they did? They See how they doubled back through and went to the churches again, didn't they? Isn't that an amazing thing as you think about it, everybody? That here you are in a life-threatening situation, you are being kicked out of a town, you're being run off, um, they want to kill you, and yet what they do is, isn't it amazing that they go back through those very same towns to do what? Does anybody know what their purpose was, according to Acts, in going back through those towns? Anybody remember what it says? Well, that's right, Claire, to spread the gospel, and even more to do something else. There's a phrase in Acts, to strengthen the believers, to strengthen the believers. So they go back through those towns where there's these fledgling churches, and they strengthen and encourage those believers that they had left, right? Because, and if you've been in my classes, you know this, everybody, the Apostle Paul is all about relationship, right? Discipleship is all about relationships. So Paul is not a hit and run evangelist. There, this is not about preach the gospel and hey, we hope to see you in heaven. When the apostle Paul preaches the gospel, he is about this idea of running together, staying with them, and visit and, and he goes back to these churches again on the second missionary journey and on the third missionary journey to these same churches. He makes sure to stop through because he really cares about those people. Um, it, it's, it's a real lesson for us, everybody, that discipleship is all about relationship. Relationship. Jesus really cares about relationships. And that's really how we grow in Christianity is through those relationships together. It's not just about growing big churches. Apostle Paul wasn't concerned about growing mega churches. He was, he was concerned about growing deep people that were deep in the faith, that were mature Christians, right? All right, so another issue then in regard to background of this letter. So when he gets back to Antioch, so again, you can see on the journey that they end back in Antioch where they began. So when they get back to Antioch, they find out that there's a controversy in the church. The controversy in the church, does anybody know what the controversy was in the church? What was the big controversy in the early church that was then settled by the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15? But he remember what that's about. There's a big controversy. It's a big issue in the early church. I referenced it just a few minutes ago. Yeah, that's basically it, Levi. That's right, Matthew. It's, it's do, do Gentile Christians have to be circumcised? In other words, here's the question. Do Gentiles essentially have to become Jews and then become Christians? Or can they just become Christians? Do Gentiles have to follow Jewish 
laws that some of the Jewish believers were following, for instance, circumcision and some of the observances. Do, do Gentile Christians have to do that or can they just accept Jesus Christ and go on? This was the controversy. And what happened was some of the Christians from Jerusalem had come up to Antioch and they wanted to set these new Gentile believers straight. You know what I mean? You ever have somebody need to set you straight? So they need to set these believers straight and tell them the real way to be Christians. I, you guys got it all wrong here. You all have to first be circumcised. And there was all kinds of confusion going on in Antioch. So when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas got back from the journey, here's this big brouhaha, this big controversy going on in the Antioch church. And if that's not bad enough, you they begin to hear news that some of these same Christians... Jewish Christians had gone to the churches in Galatia and confused them in the same way. Now, this is before the Jerusalem Council takes place. In Acts chapter 15, they have a council. They have a kind of a, a big conference, if you will. And they decide, no, Gentile Christians just need to, um, and you can read it for yourself, they need to abstain from things offered to idols and avoid sexual immorality. But other than that, they don't need to observe Jewish customs and circumcision. And so that's settled. But this is before all that. So the Apostle Paul, the point of that is this, everybody, the Apostle Paul is a very passionate. He's upset. He really, really, really feels this deeply. And so the writing of the book of Galatians takes place in the midst of all that, in the midst of all of this the Apostle Paul writes this letter to say, hey, this is what I taught you. This is the real gospel. This, this is the gospel that you heard from me. Did everybody catch how he says that down throughout the passage? Um, in verse 9, um, other than what we have preached to you, down in verse uh, about verse 8 in our passage, what, what, what we have preached to you. So don't forget what... I taught you that's the truth. So that's a little bit of background on why this letter is so passionate. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about later. It's a very, 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 very passionate letter. It's not a calm letter. You know, he's, uh, remember the line in Narnia? He's not a very tame lion, right? Well, this is not a very tame letter. This is not a, this is not a calm letter. This is a passionate letter because the Apostle Paul feels strongly about what's happening here. So I want to just cover three basic points today, everybody, about the message of these first 10 verses that I think serves as an introduction to the rest of the letter from what I can see. So everybody with me so far? Following, hearing okay? Everybody able to see images and hear okay? Okay, good. All right, so let's cover three basic points that verses 1 through 10 introduce to us and are kind of a an overview for the letter. One is this. There is a threat of replacement. There is obviously an attempt on the part of some to try to replace the gospel that had been given with what Paul calls a different gospel. You guys see how that, that term that's used throughout? He keeps referring to this other gospel or this different gospel. And so there is this constant threat of a replacement. Now, that is very strong. A couple words in verses 6 and 7 in the Greek use the prefix meta. So in verse, in verse 6, he uses the word, um, I marvel that you are turning away, turning, meta tithemi turning away so soon. And then in verse 7, um, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert, pervert, metastrepho, pervert, metastrepho. Now, some of you who know languages, what does the prefix meta mean? If you think about even English words that have the prefix meta, can anybody think of what the word meta, what the prefix meta generally refers to? generally means meta for instance metamorphosis what does the word what does the prefix meta connote change that's right, right levi levi is our greek scholar here yeah that's right matthew and claire change so metamorphosis to change form okay so meta 
antithemi, to change places. You're trying to, I marvel that you are changing places or that you are, you're switching places. Or in verse 7, that they want to pervert, metastrepho, literally to change directions. So what's going on here is this attempt to almost change the direction, to change the narrative, to exchange or change this gospel into something that God did not intend it to be something different than what we delivered to you. As again, he says that what we preached to you, what you have received from us other than what you have received. So it's the idea that there is an attempt to change, transform this gospel. And that's obviously, again, he keeps referring to this. It is something that he just kind of blares throughout these beginning verses because this is a fundamental issue of this book everybody this is kind of a warning this is kind of the alarm flag going up this is the alarm bells going off hey church wake up wake up what's going on here don't you see that there are some people that are trying to change replace the gospel a different gospel so he uses that phrase different or other in verse 6 in verse 8 verse 9 i marvel that you're turning away uh so soon to a different gospel verse 8 um uh if they preach another gospel to you verse 9 um if anyone preaches any other gospel so hey be attentive to this other gospel that is trying to infiltrate so there is even some indication here in the language that they this is very intentional. This is a plan. This is a plot. This is a game plan. This is not just accidental. These There are some folks here, he's saying Galatians, who are trying to manipulate this situation. There are some folks who, he says in verse 7, note, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. They're trying. This is purposeful. This is planned. They're trying to figure out how to lead you into something different than what we gave you, than the original true gospel. Now, again, so, uh, you, we covered a few minutes ago the background of these Judaizers who are trying to say, no, Gentiles, it's not Jesus alone. It's Jesus plus. It's not grace alone. It's grace plus. No, you you can't just accept Jesus. You have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to do step A, B, C, one, two, three, steps one through ten. You've got to jump through these hoops if you want to be a Christian. You've got to do these things, and then you can have grace. So it's always the idea of adding to Jesus. And I would I would raise this alert today, everybody, um, in the in the Jude study this fall. In the Jude class, I'm going to be talking about the ABC strategy of Satan. Satan has an ABC strategy. It's simply this. Anything but Christ. Anything but Christ. Have you all noticed that Satan, that, that we can easily get distracted in our lives with anything but Christ? They can even be good things. They can be legitimate things. They can be seemingly okay things. They can sound okay. But isn't it interesting that the strategy of Satan is, listen, as don't just don't focus on Jesus. You've got this good thing over here. You've got this good thing over here. You've got this good thing over here. It's okay. It's all right. And the strategy of Satan, let me just caution you all today. Let me raise this alarm for us in the church and for us in our lives. Watch out for anything in your life, no matter how good, that distracts you from Jesus, that gets you off focus from Jesus. Folks, anything can be used by the enemy in our lives if it gets us off Jesus. And I'm talking music. I'm talking doctrine. I'm talking theology. I'm talking school. I'm talking church stuff. We can get wrapped up in all kinds of things besides Jesus and the enemy can get us wrapped up in these kind of things. And that's exactly what's going on here. So let me ask you this today. Let me ask you this. Is there any other gospel in my life today? Is there anything that's been drawing my focus besides Jesus in my life? Boy, that's convicting, isn't it? Is there anything in my life that's been sucking away my focus instead of being focused on Jesus? 
how does he want to bring my focus back to him? So the first point today, I'm, I'm trying to go quickly, is the first point is this. There is, obviously, as we've been talking about, there is a threat of replacement. So this leads to a second point. Second point, obviously. Paul's focus is back on Jesus. And that's why I kind of titled this lesson today, The One and Only. The One and Only. Because the cry of this letter is, Church, Galatians, let's get back to Jesus and back to him alone. It's obvious, isn't it? His whole tone. Look, look at the first four verses with me. Everybody get your Bible. Look at those first four verses. Just scan through them. Isn't it obvious that the call, that his shout, his trumpet call, is to say, let's get back to Jesus. I'm an apostle, not through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. To him to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Just you hear this whole shout of let's get back to Jesus and focus on Jesus. I'm not an apostle because of anybody else but him. Our grace and our peace are from him. He gave himself to deliver and rescue us. So this, I, I believe, everybody, if I could summarize the call of Galatians, it is, folks, be aware of the ABC strategy that gets us off of Jesus. And let's get back to Jesus in our lives and in our focus and in the church. See, the whole problem in eternity, everybody, is a turning from him. I, I believe that the need of our world, I believe that the every single problem, sin, the, the origin of sin and every sin since, and the nature of, of sin, nature, and self-centeredness is that it turns us away from Jesus toward ourselves or toward something else besides him. So obviously that phrase that just keeps turning up in verses six through nine, another gospel, any other, another, another, another. It's the idea of a focus away from him instead of a focus toward him. See, I, uh, well, let me just say this today, everybody. The need of our world today is Jesus Christ. Amen. The need of our world today is Jesus Christ. The need of our world today is not one political party or another. The need of our world today is not um, some denomination. The need of our world today is not theology. The need of our world today is not a certain worship style. The need of our world today is not this or that. The need of our world today is Jesus Christ. We've got to give the world Christ. We've got to give the world Christ. We've got to give the world Jesus. And we need him. Because every uh, the, the, pro the problem with every single sin, every single problem in the world is that we don't look to him. We look to everything else but him. So Paul is crying. Let's get back to Jesus, church. Uh, that's why I am, in verse 10, a bond servant of Christ. I'm a bond servant of Christ. And I want to please, even in verse uh, 10 that he says, he says, I, I, I want to please him. I want to please him. It sounds just like Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Um I want to walk worthy of him and be fully pleasing to him. Jesus, I want to humble myself before you today, Lord. I want to come back to you and my focus in my life. And I don't want to please men. I want to please you. Amen. I want to please you. So Paul crying, shouting, trumpeting, beseeching, yelling <laughs> passionately. You hear him? Church, let's get back to Jesus. Back to him alone, the one and only. Him alone. Church, could, could we could we today, could we this year, could we this week, as we begin our school year this year, could we for the next several weeks for through this series, could we everybody say, Lord, we want you to be our focus. We want you alone. Now, Jesus, we got to do schoolwork, but we want you to be our focus in the schoolwork. Lord, I know uh I've got to hit the road on a trip here uh, a couple hours from now as soon as I finish this. Lord, I want you to be my focus on the trip. I want you to be my focus in my family life. I want you to be the focus in my homework. I want you to be the focus, Jesus, when I go to sleep at night, when I'm not feeling good, when I eat my meals, when I type emails, when I preach a sermon tomorrow morning. Lord Jesus, I want you to be the I want you to be my constant 
focus. And, and wouldn't it be something if we said we're committing this entire school year to you because we want that to be the pattern of the rest of our lives. We want you to be our focus, our constant focus in everything, Jesus. I want you back to you. I don't want school to be my focus. I want you to be the focus in my school. I don't, I don't want my work to be, I want you to be the focus in my work. I, I want you to be the focus in the raising of my kids. I want you to be my focus. So do you see everybody, they even needed revival in the early church. Isn't that amazing? Even the early church needed revival. <laughs> they had to come back to focus too, which is our need today too. It's revival is saying, wow, where do I need to get back on focus in my life? And so we're praying for revival in the churches, revival all over the world, revival in America, revival here at TPS and CLM, uh, Change Lives Ministries. Jesus, we want revival in our families. We, Where can you bring us back to focus in these days? So one final point, so two so far. So again, there is a threat of replacement. Secondly, Paul's saying, church, let's get back to him because he's the answer. Let's get back to the the gospel, the one and only. And then finally, you hear this passion. Oh, does everybody hear the strong passion in Paul? He's so passionate in this. And 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 the circumstances we looked at explain his passion, don't they? The circumstances, he's really upset. It's like, this can't be. We, we can't have our attention being drawn away from the gospel and being drawn away from Christ the way it is. That can't happen here at Antioch. It can't happen in those. So you hear the strong passion. One commentator on the book of Galatians, uh, Longenecker, in his commentary says, Paul is, quote, like a lion turned loose in the arena of Christianity. He's passionate, man. He's on fire in this letter. You guys remember in NBA Jam? Anybody play NBA Jam? He's on fire, right? So that's uh, the apostle Paul is on fire in this letter. He is just um he's passionate in the writing of this this is not casual or laid back so do you hear it in the tone this this is why he says in verse six i marvel the word thalmazo in greek only time it's used in paul paul's letters i marvel i marvel it's just i'm astonished i'm amazed i'm overwhelmed i in other words he might be saying like in today's vernacular really guys I'm, I'm astonished. And then he goes on in that verse to say that you are turning away so soon. So you hear the passion. You hear the, the outcry, the upheaval in his life. And he's so passionate. He says, hey, in verses 8 and 9, if anybody preaches something else besides Christ, besides what we gave you, let him be accursed. You know, if you look up that um literal translation of that in the uh, new english translation says let him be condemned to hell that's pretty passionate it's pretty passionate apostle paul is really passionate about this why is he so passionate well all he'd been through think about it he'd been on that journey all he'd been through with those churches he literally sacrificed his life risked his life and literally he's so passionate because he's saying guys this is the only chance we got all this other stuff is distraction, is peripheral. This Jesus and this gospel is the only chance we got, church. So he's passionate. Can I ask you today, what are you passionate about? You don't have to answer this or anything. I just want you to think about today, what are you passionate about? I, I made a list of things that sometimes we get passionate about. We get passionate about our sports, right? Anybody here get passionate about sports? I get passionate about sports. We get passionate about politics. Uh, people, <laughs> Mr. Crosby and I have this ongoing passion about the Cubs and the Cardinals, right? So we get passionate about, uh, some people get passionate about the opposite sex, right? So teenagers, you know, have, you know, issues, you know, there's, there's hormones and you get passionate about you know, the opposite sex, we get we get passionate about peer pressure, we get passionate about injustice. So we get passionate about things in our world. It's not that we don't get passionate. I just wonder what we get passionate about. Paul was passionate about this. Would I be willing to be moved by Jesus? 
Would I be willing to be passionate and moved by Jesus in my life? That Jesus, you're my one and only. It's okay. I'm going to watch sports. That's cool. But Jesus, I want to be passionate about you. Jesus, I, I'm going to follow politics. But Jesus, it, that's cool. Whatever happens, you're in charge. And, and that's quite a surrender right now, isn't it, folks? But I'm going to be passionate about you. I want to be passionate about you. Jesus, I, I, I want to be passionate about you. I want you to be the one and only of my life. I want to be moved by you. And you know what, guys? I think it's needed in our day. Don't you? And, and thank you for pointing that out, Baker family. Those could be the anything but Christ, right? Those could be the distractions in my life. Yeah, that's right. Does everybody agree that we need that? Do you think that maybe we're so emotionally spent as Christians on all these other things, we don't have any emotion left for Jesus? We don't have anything left for him. But I, I believe that we need passionate, moved Deep down, deep feeling, loving Jesus, my one and only Christians in our day. Folks, that is what's going to lead people to him. What's going to lead people to Jesus in our day? Not lukewarm Christianity, not just going through the motions, not like Jesus is an add-on in my life, not just I've got all these other things and, hey, Jesus is one of them. Folks, I, I really believe this, everybody, today. The only thing that's going to lead people to Jesus, that's going to, see, isn't that what people want to follow? Isn't that what people want to see? Isn't that what they're looking for? Hey, I want something that's real. I want something that's real. But guess what today, everybody, as I finish up today? I can't. Uh, it's more than I can do. <laughs> I don't know how to be that way. But you know what the beauty of that is? That's why Paul talks the way he does in verses 1 through 5. Grace to you and peace. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He even says in verse 1, hey, hey I'm, not, I'm an apostle not through man or not from man, but from him. And grace and peace to you from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil age. To whom, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And you all know Galatians 2.20 that we'll cover later on. But I, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So church today, it's not me doing this. I, This isn't me. He's doing something in me. So today, is there anybody here besides me that says, Boy, I don't want to be distracted with anything else. I want Jesus to be my one and only. And I want to be moved by him. And I want to have a focus on him like I need to in my life. But you know what? I feel like over and over again, I fail and I just can't get it right. Well, there's good news today, everybody, from the book of Galatians. There's really good news. He's our rescue. He's our rescue. He's our grace. He's our strength. And he can do in our lives far more than we can ask or imagine. So as we embark on the school year and continue in the study of Galatians today, would you just open yourself today with me? Would you open yourself to me as we prepare to sing a song of response together today? Would you just say, Jesus, I want to seek you today. I want to focus on you. But Jesus, I want to be moved by you. But I need you to do something in my heart today that makes that possible like never before. 